Uh, we are here today for the seminar on Colombia silencing, silencing civil society voices. And we are very happy to welcome Laura Bonilla, Regional Director at Forum Civ for the Latin America and Caribbean region, uh, who's going to talk to us uh, about the developments in Colombia right now and a little bit about the state of civil society and the ongoing national elections. And without much more ado, I would hand over to Laura. <laughs> thank you so much, Karin, and thank you so much for coming to listen to us. Uh, as just Karin said, I am the regional director of Forum Ship for Latin America and Caribbean. We are basically a Swedish civil society organizations uh, with a lot of members, 183, I think, but we are around this number and we hope that many more quite soon. Uh, this seminar is called Silencing uh, Grassroot Voices or Silencing Civil Society Voices because we want to be very emphatic that who are in a great danger or who are in a great risk in Colombia right now. So not only about, we don't want to talk only about what is happening, we want to talk where are the consequences of what is happening, and not only for Colombia, also for the whole region, for Latin America, and also for the world, because we are also talking about the uh, threatenings to democracy, and we are talking about this world where apparently civil society is not right now so important for certain decisions makers. So let's start, and I want to start with a very brief presentation about the peace agreement. And don't worry, we are going to talk about elections also, but this time the elections are quite connected with what happened with the peace agreement and what happened with the situation in Colombia regarding one, long-term armed conflict and regarding also the violence against civil society organizations, including leadership uh, of indigenous, communi uh, indigenous communities, including civil society organizations, including LGBT people, including grassroots organizations, small-scale farmers, peace and movements, and basically a lot of people with strong voices and the possibilities to change things and to support democracy and human rights. That's, uh, so the first thing that I want to say uh, is that after the signature of the peace agreement in 2016, uh, the peace was real for two years at least, you know, between 2014, 2016, maybe 18, 18 uh, 17, 18, uh, we really have peace dividends. Uh, first, we have a lot of participation in the regions, in rural areas, uh, to develop certain plans. It's, uh, it's, uh, it was called it like um, development plans with a territorial approach, but that in Spanish. Uh, we have a lot of people working for peace building and working for the reconstruction uh, of social fabric, but basically communitarian efforts around that. And we also have a lot of committed communities, local dialogues, a new set of local leadership. And it's very curious how what is happening now, you know, this, this dramatic amount of numbers of killed people with leadership, with social leadership, uh, happened before, after the signature of another peace agreement in Colombia that this was in 1991. So that happened before. After the peace agreement, it was a huge amount of social movement, a huge amount of people trying to implement the reforms and that people were killed in that time. And these same people, not same person, same kind of people is, Killing. No, it's not killing, it's killing again. So it's, they have been murdered again. So second, there are violent threats against peace. It's important to say it like this because 
there is a narrative in the country saying that this is not a threat against peace agreement. This is not a threat against peace. This is not a threat against democracy. Uh, the fact that thousands and thousands of leaders have been murdered, it's just a coincidence. This is a narcos issue. This is a criminal guns issue. This is a criminal guns violence. This is about criminal economies and that is the reason, the only reason of this new wave of violence. So, but the point is that most of the victims belongs to civil society organizations, belongs to indigenous communities, and they are people with leadership, including 300 persons that signed the peace agreement, you know, former guerrilla members, signed the peace agreement and 300 of these people have been murdered since the signature of the peace agreement. So it is a huge number of people dead. So it's, there are a lot of negative consequences for the quality of democracy because we are starting to believe that there is not possible peace. But we are also starting to accept that it's normal that in certain regions people cannot just go and vote for whatever they want. And it's normal that people in certain regions cannot access to their rights in any sense, or that it's normal that certain people in certain regions like Cauca department can just walk in the streets because the violence is so high right now. So, and of course, this is connected and this is related with an inefficient or negligent negligent government answer for victims and affected communities. So basically, if you see the answer of the government is saying that, yes, we are putting a lot of money for implement the peace agreement. The point is in what parts are you putting that money? For what? And what is the results? Because I can spend 4,000 million euros, you know, paying bureaucracy in Bogota, in the capital of the country. And that doesn't mean that the people are receiving the peace agreement dividends or they are not receiving the peace agreement benefits. Uh, and that these plans for, these plans for with the rhetoric approach to implement peace, they are not starting to be implemented after five years of the peace agreement signature. So, and this is the most extensive crisis of human rights since, in, you know, in at least 20 years. And this is related with a conflict that we are not seeing because all this narrative is hiding what is happening. So uh, there is civil society organizations under threat. And we are pretty clear on this. The people mm -hmm. organized claiming for the rights are under threat. So it's not an individual situation. It's not criminal guns, it's not passion crimes with one prosecutor of the Colombian state say that it's a passion crime. So no, there is not. So what to do? And this is real that we started with what to do, but I want to really to spread them this message. What to do? We need to be focused efforts on protection of peace. So it is more important than ever to say, peace is important, we need to protect peace. We need to guarantee the implementation of peace agreement because that implementation will build the basis to protect this small scale of this early dividends of peace. So, and protect the peace builders. Who are the peace builders? Communities, small scale farmers, grassroots organizations, they are doing the job. And they are not just this job to implement peace. They are doing basically all the job regarding our development perspective in Forum C, but regarding the development perspective of all the cooperation in the world. So they are doing the work for gender equality. They are doing the job to resilience against climate change, to uh, diminish the consequences of climate change. They are doing the job to protect the Amazonas, which is extremely important for the world, for the climate. And they are being threatened and then kill it. So, in several areas, so we need to protect them. That's a big effort. So pressure on the Colombian government, if you can, of course, uh, to show results in protection. The message cannot be that 
yeah, we are concerned about the protection of the people or they are not leaders, they are just people or the answer cannot be, um, ah, but maybe these leaders have been involved in some dark businesses uh, because that is not true first. And then because they are people and it's quite easy to show that these people were people with leadership. So it's really important to ask the duty bearers for results. Are we protecting them? Are we doing everything in our hands to protecting them? And starting with the narrative, we need to change the narrative and we need to start to say civil society is important, peace builders are important, People in those communities are important. They are not terrorists. They are not this, you know, they are not narcos. They are not narco terrorists. So they are people who needs to be protected. If I am living in a region with a high risk to be threatened, of course, I am living in a complex context. I am not the responsible to being killed. So um, I have a couple of cases that really you know, hard, personally hard. We have been working in an indigenous community, the strengthening the capacity for women to access their rights. One of those women, a very strong and important woman in the community, for the first time in 30 years, you know, she was elected as the governor of that community. We were so happy and so proud about that and now this woman is under threat. Why? Because she and other indigenous women are in an open opposition against the forced recruitment of children in their communities. So, and instead of protecting them, the answer have been or militarization, which is much worse for the regions and for the communities or saying that, well, you know, Laugh it hard, no? If you have armed groups, close your community, you need, you as a civilian need to do something. So it, it, it's quite frustrating that. And other thing that we can do is support the dialogue efforts and the escalating efforts, because right now the words have a lot of power in the country. And if the narrative of this conflict is this kind of super militarized narrative, this kind of violent narrative against people, against each other, we are not contributing to support the peace in the country. So pressure to change that narrative and to recognize that this is human rights violation situation, this is not another thing, it's really important for people. So with this tip of mind, so we are going to talk about elections. Now, um, we can go next. So if you put the mouse in that place, in that place, there is a link and it's a two minutes video that I want to show you. It's in Twitter also, so it's not some kind of propaganda, <laughs> but I, I didn't find it in YouTube. After 50 years of civil war, the Colombian government signed a peace agreement with the guerrilla group FARC. At the time, it seemed like an opportunity to strengthen peace-building efforts throughout the country. So then why is violence and human rights violations now on the rise? In many regions, FARC left the power vacuum, which is now being fought over by various armed actors. The Colombian government is trying to regain territorial control referring to the violence as terrorism or related to drug trade. This militarization has led to gruesome attacks such as massacres, forced displacement of farmers, indigenous people and Afro-Colombians. Human rights defenders and LGBTQ leaders are in great danger of targeted assassinations. Despite high risks, many Colombian civil society organizations are doing everything they can to support the peace-building process and defend the democratic rights. <laughs> well, thank you for letting me present the video. So with this new cycle of violence until today, we have, uh, this is I, this is not the right number, so sorry. I put it, my dyslexia, sorry. It's 84, not 48. So 
who are the people, who are the victims here? Mostly indigenous leaders. Why? Because they are too close to this new cycle of violence. And sometimes some institutional actors and state actors in the field prefers to protect who are threatening them and not protect them. Why? Because there is a lot of money circulating close of that community. So basically, people involved with peace agreement efforts implies people trying to promote development in the country. And promote development in the country is taking off people from the war. And people are also part of this business. So if I am recruiting young people, children and teenagers from those communities and the leaders are in why you position against that? The indigenous communities in Colombia are really, really, really against the coca crop for business purposes. They, are, they have traditional and ancestral uses of coca, but it's quite different. Uh, and definitely they don't like that their children and teenagers have been recruited by armed groups. It's totally against the perception of lie on the cosmovision in the world. So that is one of the reasons, because they are under threat. So speaking about recruiting of children now is put in danger. Second, people claiming for the rights to land or people implementing in this region peace efforts, development efforts. We have the case of a cooperative with reincorporated people, former FAR guerrilla members working between the Meta and Guaviare now ecological cattling, that is it, by the way, if it's possible, an ecological cattling project, you know, combining agroecology principles and that. And it was, by the way, very successful. And the investment together with European Union, with Sweden, with a lot of countries, you know, everyone was super happy with the project because it was successful for reincorporation, it was successful, economic successful, and this is quite rare, uh, it's not common to, you know, to have this uh, success in this kind of economic projects. The whole project was displaced because they received death threats for an armed group. So they have to leave the machines, leave the cattle, leave everything, the crops, and trying to, again, after five years of work, starting from zero, looking for something to do or lose their lives. Right now in Arauca, just in Arauca, which is you know very close to Venezuela, we had a <clears throat> real war between the ELN guerrilla and some uh, dissident and criminal gangs. And um, one thing that sometimes happens is that the state actors, and I mean, sometimes the army just say, you know, these people are killing each other. So let's, pick a side or let's do nothing. Let them to kill wherever they want. One car with people of the United Nations were burned close to that area. And two offices of NGOs were attacked for the first time in 20 years. So it's not like a gang uh, issue. It's more than that. So what is happening with these conflicts and, uh, and why these conflicts are quite connected with the elections is two things. For the first time in Colombia, after the signature of the peace agreement, we try to elect representative of the victims, which sounds super good because that victims should represent the most abandoned and marginalized regions. But what happened is that some people, including clientelistic and opportunistic political parties, and also included uh, some of violent actors trying to push those elections, and that create a lot of more violence. So the recent election to Congress have uh, had, sorry, the Spanish to English there, sometimes I forgot. <laughs> I forget a lot of words and forget the times, the president and past and things. But the point is that this new Congress 
And if you want to see more of this analysis, I highly recommend the web page of our partner, the Fundación Paz y Reconciliación, the Paris Foundation, because they have this interactive map. So I'm just showing the picture, but you can interact with the map uh, in internet. They are a quite serious uh, civil society and brave civil society organization. So I highly recommend them. So basically, what we see in these elections is half to half. You know, it's a country, a broken country divided in several parts. This part are basically the most right oriented parties. Uh, this is quite anti peace agreement or anti peace efforts. These political parties are the. the Yes, this is the party of the former Uribe president, also, you know, a very anti peace agreement. This is the Green Party and like the center of the political spectrum. And this is the uh, new uh, left coalition called um, Pact to Historic, like historical pact. Hmm? That is the composition of the Senate of the Republic of Colombia. Many people were quite happy because for the first time, this part and this part are quite big for the first time in history. But at the same time, we have this part. And this is important, Liberal Party and Conservative Party. These two parties are basically opportunistic parties. What means that they will choose a side, depends of what will be more convenient for them and not in terms of public opinion. Because right now, something that is good is the public opinion are quite a lot in favor to protect social leaders. So we have the public opinion in favor. So people are so tired to being killed. People are so tired of this violence and people believe that the social leaders and the human rights defenders are doing a good job and we need to protect them. And the government is not quite popular those days, but we have this, but these people can change everything because they are opportunistic parties. So basically they are keen makers in political science. What they decide will affect the presidential elections. We don't know what will happen. In any case, it's a very interesting scenario, but it's a scenario quite contaminated by violence. So if you are asking yourself why people vote for these opportunistic political parties, um, I should answer why not. The problem in countries like Colombia and in several countries in Latin America is that the clientelist, so people believe that clientelist is someone give you money the day of elections. And that is not the problem. You, the problem is what happened if you as a citizen say no to that money. What is the consequence? What is the system of incentive? You know, beyond elections. So what is the quality of democracy in these regions? What happened if I am a citizen and I say no to that money, the day of election, maybe nothing happened, but the next, for years, if I am living in a marginalized region, I will not have access to the basic goods and services from the state. Basically, because I will not have an intermediary. The leader of this neighborhood will not support me to present my requisition for the, my father or my parents' uh, uh, support or my parents' social program. Uh, they, he will not help me to find a school for my children. He will not allow me to present my CV uh, for a position in the mayor office or for a position in a public sector. So basically these opportunistic parties in the regions, they are in control of employment, in control of healthcare, in control of every single service and good provided by the state. That's why they have so much power. So basically people say that mm, it's not so simple like making you know, good campaigns, you know, vote good, vote good. It's a whole system of incentive and it's quite connected with violence. 
Once the system is failing and appears some kind of or charismatic or democratic movement trying to push these people out, the violence appears and changes things. And maybe this presidential election will be different, but maybe not. So let's see what will happen. So we can go next. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, the, the political parties that are against the peace agreement, are they from one angle or is it both those who would, who do not like the peace agreement because of the government or because of FARC? They don't like the peace agreement because deeply they believe that FARC should be uh, military defeated. Uh, and also, uh, because some of those political parties or some of those people within that political parties believe also that uh, they are quite right, 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 right oriented. They don't like a lot of uh, peace efforts. They like uh, militarization. They believe in the violent pacification of the country. And they have quite connected with certain parts of the army who are most, uh, active or most proactive regarding active violence or things like this, because they are another part of the army pro-peace agreement. So, but they represent in this part. And also there is a lot of conservative movement that believes that, uh, did you know about this uh, conservative idea that we, the civil society and other feminist movement, we will become everybody gay Latin America? Mm -hmm. But that plays in against the peace agreement because mo a lot of people uh, truly believe that the inclusion of the gender approach in the peace agreement, which was a great achievement of the peace movement and the feminist movement, will become people gay. Mm -hmm. So that inclusion, saying gender, will become people gay. And that includes a lot of people that votes for them. So anti-abortion, anti-peace, anti-feminist, I quite connect in in this in in their political views. That is the reason. And and just to clarify for the people listening over Zoom, that the question was whether it's a particular side of the political spectrum yeah. that's against the peace agreement, or whether you can see it on on all sides of the criticism. Yeah. So there is a lot of criticisms to the peace agreement, but that is one of these people. Of course, there is people saying that we need to implement and we are not implementing, but that, that is another thing. Yes. I have a more general question concerning the Very violence uh, <coughs> that you have spoken about. I have quite understood yet who's behind that broad violence that obviously is taking place. Does it have to anything to do with the old paramilitary para groups that existed before historically? Or the, the same kind of groups that are acting now again? Or there are new groups that are formed and how are they structured? Who are behind them? Are there political parties that are sort of using them for, 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 for uh, their objectives? Or it's, it's still a bit vague to me. I'm just going to repeat the question yeah. quickly into the microphone. So um, I remember the audience was asking if um, the groups who are behind this violence, is it the, the old paramilitary groups that were involved in the conflict running up to the peace agreement, uh, or are these completely new groups, uh, which different types of actors are perpetrating violence against human rights defenders, indigenous leaders, and so on? It's a huge confluence of actors. So basically the answer is yes to everything. <laughs> yes. There is a new, but new, same kind of paramilitarist groups. Uh, but basically some of them are now connected with former uh, middle commanders uh, from far guerrilla in certain areas. Uh, both of them there also can be connected with other armed groups in other parts. And some of them could be fighting this month and next month could find an agreement. And also uh, the armed forces have a lot to do in the violence in a negligent or in an active way. There is a few cases 
where militaries itself were involved in human rights violations and human rights, you know, abuses against citizens, against indigenous populations, against people in demonstrations, against basically everything. Uh, and there is other cases where the former guerrilla, some former guerrilla members plus another new recruitments are creating a new type of armed groups. The point is why? The question is why and who are affected? Because for so many years, we were talking about who are performing this violence and we are not considering who are being affected with this violence, but very specifically, so why this is happening, why it's so easy that I'm going to give you an example in Cauca also. There is a town in Cauca called Argelia and nobody can go to that town without permission of the armed group ruling that area. The question is why these armed groups have so many power it's not only because the COCA. You can run a business, a very successful business, and you will never have that kind of power. It's not only because the guns, because after the peace agreement, these people were like 10 men, 10 young men with short guns. How a group of 10 men with short guns will became in four years, a group of hundreds of people with long guns. What is you know, where the money came from. And I, you know, I assume that a lot of you, you know, are familiar related with Colombia, but if I try to buy something in Ikea without paying taxes, if I put that Ikea stuff that I love it into a bag and I send that bag to my house in Colombia in a ship, for sure that bag will be stuck it in the tax agency in Colombia. It's not possible to do that for me as a citizen. Do you know, I, I, I will have to pay the taxes to receive my merch, you know, my things. What about the guns? Hmm? Or I am running all the ports, I am running all the sea or definitely I am buying guns in someone else. And most of those guns are locally fabricated and not illegally fabricated, but locally fabricated. So who fabricate guns in the country? Who is this, the owner of this business? So there is a lot of people gaining here. The point is that who are against this violent situation? Basically, civil society organizations, all kinds of civil society are against this violence in the country. And we are letting, no you, not really, no me, but we as a society are letting them along. That's a very important point. So my message is let's focus a little bit to protect the people and to protect the democratic efforts that they are doing. Because it's really important to protect the climate change projects that they are doing to protect the people who is protecting the Amazonas or just the big business now in Caqueta, in Colombia is the deforestation. We want to stop the climate change. We can start in stopping the deforestation in the Caqueta. And there is people trying to do this. These people have is under a great danger. Nobody is protecting them because a lot of politicians are gaining from the same deforestation. So. That's a quite, I know it's a difficult question, but yeah. But if, if I've understood correctly from, from some of the research and, and, and some of you, what you've already been telling us as well, is that um, criminal gangs is, is a very integral part to this violence and, yeah. and to, some, to a large extent the coca trade uh, and thereby also land use. So grabbing land and using it for, for coca plantations uh, perhaps taking land that's already being used by farmers to do other type of farming or perhaps also clear cutting then of rainforests or no? Whatever you yeah. can. So yeah. whatever you can do in a region. So you have regions with petroleum, you will be, the violence will be involved with petroleum. Mm. If you have regions with coca, the violence will be involved with coca. If you have regions with 
another kind of production, the vi- and the violence is there, mm-hmm. the violence will be automatically involved with the most successful business. For instance, uh, in certain cities, and this is not happening only in Colombia, this is happening in other cities in America Latina, uh, what happened is that when the narco-traffic is not so good business, these armed groups can migrate to other kinds of business, like extortion. It's immediately, is there is, you know, pushing people for protection and then asking the money back. Um, but that is not really the problem. The problem is not the economy itself. The problem is that this violence is deeply connected with our institutions. And we are not recognizing that because it's a very difficult message to recognize that it is impossible to have this type of violence in a state like Colombia, because Colombia is a strong state. It's not a weak state. It's a strong state with a lot of capacity and with a lot of presence in all the country. So why the state is not focused protecting people? That is the question. Why are you not protecting the people? Why are you letting these people die? I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, who is responsible for the, the deforestation? A lot of people, basically. Could be industries, could be illegal businesses, uh, could be whatever kind of plantation. You can choose basically everything. Uh, if you're asking me, if there is a specific who is who is responsible for protect that forest? Yeah, that, that, that was my big question because <laughs> you, you 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 told us that uh, that is a strong movement. It's a it's a it's a it's a, a strong nation. Yeah. Uh, how uh, how can that nation uh, alone? That's just to just to say with just to get it over to Zoom as well. So how can how can such a strong state that has control of the territory allow their for state deforestation to happen? What happened? I can be strong. That doesn't mean that I want to protect the environment. Exactly. I can be strong. I can have a lot of capacity for a lot of things, and I don't want to do that. So that who is, is the responsible? Do you want to tell you who is responsible? You have the answer, who is responsible? Mm-hmm. For me, the point with the deforestation is that right now, uh, the government have been so focused to say that farmers are deforestating the forest. So we will put bombs to that areas and we will start a military campaign against apparently the deforestation, but we are not prosecuting the money, we are not prosecuting the deforestation itself, we are not prosecuting the building, and there is a lot of businesses involved. So, and in the other hand, that is my, it's always my approach to show what is doing the civil society. In the other hand, do you know that in the peasants reserve zones, you know, handling by farmers itself is a governance figure recognized by the state and things in that sense, you know, when you give the farmers and when you give the people the capacity also to produce and protect the environment, the rate of deforestation is almost zero. So there is a way to stop the deforestation, but we are not promoting that. We are promoting the military solution with this like, a, you know, some kind of greenwashing. Mm-hmm. For businesses and for also for institutions in that self. So yeah. Yeah, but that makes only one responsibility. So, Sorry, uh, I feel yes, yeah, more questions. I think um, I have a bit of gist of what you're trying to say. So uh, what you're trying to say is uh, this is an economically different country. But on the other hand, um, there's no proper legislation, and that's the root cause of the problem. No, the legislation is perfect. If the legislation is so good, 
We don't need to change the laws. And, and we don't need to, and the government doesn't need to change or follow the rules. That's the point with America Latina. And not only in Colombia, that happened also in Mexico, that happened in Venezuela, that happened in a lot of countries. Imagine that our region and our countries highlight two sides in a coin. You show this side, our constitution is so beautiful. Our laws, we have a law for protection of the victims, we have a law for protection, we have a anti-discrimination law. We have like, I don't know how many laws, very progressive laws and very good laws to protect people. We have a presidential decree to protect the communities and to protect the leaders. You have this. So you travel to Europe, you travel to the world and to say that I have this new law. This is so fantastic. Uh, I will do that. And then you have this phase. In this phase, you allow that everything happened, but under the carpet. That's the Colombian way, and that's the Latin American way. Let everything happen under the carpet. So you don't need to change the laws. You always will have this possibility to do things like this. Yes, uh, may I just to finalize this part, and then we will have a lot of questions. And this is super good because I love that the people have a lot of you know have questions. This I, I I am really happy to hear you. So one minute to say this: the consequences of this. One, the institutional narrative is justifying the violence. That is not possible. We need to change that. We need a narrative to protect the people, to protect peace, to say yes to democracy. We don't need a narrative just, you know, with a strong justification of the violence. This is not correct. Uh, second, and this is part of your question, we have a confluence of violent agendas with several actors. So we cannot say today that there is one agenda, one agenda. It's like every people with a violent interest itself, you know, uh, are together doing this kind of things. And that could be several kind of actors, several kind of groups. Um, three, in that same spirit, peace movements and critical movements are perceived as an enemies, as an uncomfortable people. And it's true, they are uncomfortable people right now. So people asking for LGBTQ rules, there is a violent offer to threat these people. So I can go to that violent offer and say that I am feeling uncomfortable with this trans person that is walking in my neighborhood. And there is a lot of hate crimes against transgender people in the country also connected with this same kind of violence. Uh, and we are losing the democratic leadership in the country. Why? Because what happened if these women that we are talking about in this indigenous community will be killed, what happened with the community? That community will spend a lot of time, a lot of time, years, maybe decades to recover themselves for that murder. It's not easy to recover for the murder of one of those leaders. It's really dramatic. So, and people will understand that if you are a stand up against the, you know, the recruitment, the forced recruitment of children, you will be murdered. So you keep quiet. And people quiet are not, you know, are not promoting a democratic space. So the shrinking space in Latin America, in Colombia specifically, is no true rules. It's no true laws. It's true violence. But it is shrinking space. So, and what to do? Again, change narrative, recognize the conflict and the victims, help to de-escalate, visibilize and recognize the people who are doing the job. So right now it's really important to know that there is a lot of people, a lot of communities, a lot of civil society organizations, environmental activists, people working for human rights that needs our support to do the job, to do the job in favor of uh, the SDG goals, people doing the job to accomplish that, people doing the job to pressure, you know, democratically and peacefully pressure the different governments and countries to protect the environment, to accomplish Paris Agreement. So that, that is the people that we need to protect, but we need these people alive. That's the first point. So, yes, and ask 
whatever you want as for concrete results challenge the destructive narratives what was the destructive narratives um i have to confess that i like you know this action movies and latin american whatever but the narcos narrative are really really bad this is not a gang war this is not a narcos war People are not being killed because Sinaloa, because whatever. They are actors, of course, they exist, of course, they have interests, of course, but that don't explain what is happening right now. So, and definitely that narrative put the victims in the wrong place. When you see a movie like this, okay, it's, it's, it's quite entertainment. Uh, I don't know, the series of Pablo Escobar or whatever, but when you see this as the explanation of the situation, the victims are not victims. The victims are just people involved in a criminal business. And I can tell you that for so many years that, you know, after so many years, now it's becoming difficult to talk about this in Colombia. Because most than before, people are saying, but but why is these people being killed? Well, maybe they are, you know, the coca issue. Yeah, the coca issue, yes, maybe. But no. So these people are doing an important job, let's protect them. That's my final message. That is a destructive narrative. Other destructive narrative is quite common right now in Colombia. Civil society is involved. Uh, but you know, in the guerrilla places, the civil society there are part of the guerrilla. I know, but the people in that village, they are supporting the whatever name of the uh, dissident group. Uh, no, in that other place in the Caribbean, you know, the indigenous people are quite involved in the marijuana business. That is the reason because they are in the middle of all of this. That is another destructive narrative. And if we together as a citizens in the world start to challenge that narratives, I have to say in Colombia, but also in other countries in the region, I think that we can make a great difference. That's now the questions. One, two, three. Oh, three questions. Yes. Um, this is connected to one of the other questions we have here about who is behind uh, those different crimes. And you said that it's very complex and there are many different actors behind uh, the killings of human rights defenders and social leaders and so on. Um, but it also sounded like you felt, I don't know if this is how I got it, that there's maybe too much focus on who's behind and you feel like it's, it will be, or there's more focus needed on strengthening rights. Is yeah. that how I, okay? Do you yeah. feel like it has, okay, and social movements in general in Colombia or? No, outside Colombia. Outside, yeah basically outside, outside Colombia. So the question was if I felt that there is a lot of uh, pressure about uh, who is behind this uh, and less interest about the civil society itself. And I say, yes, that's one of my points about to change this narrative. Uh, because if I always, if I am always open, that is so important to know who is behind. It's so important, the justice, but right now, due to the emergency of this situation, it's really important to make a call to protect the people. And that is more important than who is behind, because who is behind have a lot of explanations. I understand perfectly the need for justice, but we need people alive. We really need these people alive. It's so important for democracy to have them alive and doing their job. So let's Let's combine a little bit the things I have to say. Yes. Uh, just uh, if I can jump in between just for a moment. For start, so thank you so much, Laura, for this yeah. presentation and for answering all the questions from the audience during the presentation. It is super interesting and and it's so good for us to get this, this first hand perspective of developments in Colombia. So thank you so much. And um, just sort of tying in a little bit to what you were just discussing. So there is the issue of, of well, the need to protect civil society, uh, to protect uh, local leaders and so on, the population in general, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, there is a lot of political messaging about the need to do this. So how, how do we go from 
political messaging about the need to protect uh, civilians, leaders, and so on, to, to actual action, you know, to actual, to actually protecting. We or all? Uh, okay. We are supporting the civil society organizations in the country through different tools. But basically during this, the last five years since implementation of the peace agreement, we have been supporting for development directly cooperative or incorporated population and also farmers and a small scale peace and, and the peace and movement in Cuba. That have been our expertise for more than 10 years in our program in the country. Uh, what happened is that from two years ago to now, our world has become so difficult because it doesn't have any sense that I implement a project to strengthen the capacity of a farmer organization to produce coffee with agricultural good experience, with green ecological principles, with agroecological principles, and then these people suffer an attack, or these people, you know in murder or in Putumayo, in another region, we supported for so many years a women association and a prison association. And right now we are feeling that the urgency is the protection. That's why we turn a little bit the message, but we are still trying to promote that efforts for peace. So it's both. It's continue working, advocating for the rights of the people, and support them to advocate themselves for their rights. So, but what the, I, I can tell you this, and I am 100% sure, and I will, I, I, I never, I am never 100% sure of nothing, but all the civil society organizations in Colombia will tell you the same, help us to protect our lives. And then, we can think in a lot of infinite possibilities to support and to go to action. So I know the Sweden civil society, especially Sweden civil society, I'm a quite fan, no? I'm working in for Sweden. Uh, it's extremely creative and also it's extremely active in the world to promote certain causes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know also that the Swedish society is quite concerned about the climate change. So. Let's connect a little bit the things. Let's connect the efforts to protect the climate change with the efforts to protect the people who are protecting the climate change itself. I think that that will be a great change and that will be a great starting point to do. And let's include that in the conversations. No, so tired that they, I do you see I try a good Colombian coffee. By the way, Colombia, we know that happened in Colombia, but that could be once a week. And then looking at perhaps the higher level and the political level. So I noticed that there was a, a call from around 80 different civil society organizations uh, to uh, international leaders and especially to the EU uh, to speak up about uh, the situation in Colombia and about the, the murders and the, and the attacks on, on civilians. Um, and, and one very particular demand was that this would be brought up in the human rights dialogue with between the EU and Colombia, yes. uh, which happened earlier this year, I believe. Yes. And uh, there was then another letter uh, from these organizations where you were sort of responding to this um, because the final statements uh, that was released after this meeting didn't even mention uh, uh -huh. these attacks. Would you care to elaborate? Like, is, is there, why do you think there is this reluctance to, to speak out about? This, uh, what's happening? I don't know, honestly. I think that uh, we have been losing as a citizens of the world, not only here, in all the world, uh, a part of our potential to be here in certain parts in the world, especially with you. Uh, and I also believe that we need to increase the voice against of citizens in this type of situation. Because the government, this government have been particularly uh, passive aggressive with the international community. 
uh, when the government traveled a lot around the world, uh, showing the results of the peace agreement in Colombia, they are not talking about human rights violations and they are pressured the dialogue to don't talk about human rights violations. So it's quite difficult also for the diplomatic body to talk about this right now. It's like the, if, if you see the Encanto movie uh, about Colombia, it is, there is a very popular song. We don't talk about Bruno, it comes in the Oscars, but this is a metaphor about what is happening right now. We don't talk about Bruno, we don't talk about this. Senor, uh, but this is another one, two, three, and four. I'm so sorry, so many yeah. questions. I would just, uh, she was just, first. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm just gonna have to jump in really quickly. Do we have any questions on Zoom? Yes, one. Yeah. Um, but you so, can take that later because it's, uh, yeah, we can take Okay, that. perfect. Mm -hmm. So please continue. Yeah, I was wondering about so, um, the different peace initiatives and also the, the government efforts that do exist for peace and, and reincorporation and so on. Like, how is the dynamic between the civil society and the government um, authorities mm -hmm. in that respect? And also, um, having in mind the corruption and, and clientelism that you were talking about like how does that work with the um with the reincorporation efforts and so on um like and what's your opinion on that is it well done or i, I have mixed feelings but can you put the last uh, type because i want to show you something especially in that part the last one is the picture oh, oh the last one okay. oh, this one yeah. This is how, for me, how the peace looks. And I have to say that at the local level, the presence and the efforts of some public functionaries, especially in the Agency for Rain Corporation, have been so good. And they are also, they have a lot of concerns. You know, I, had, I know so many meetings with them. Uh, and I saw people, you know, so frustrated because also they are seeing that it's, it's, it's impossible to work like this and we want to do a good work. So even the people from the government side doing this type of work have a lot of concerns about what is happening with recuperated population. So it's not about the functionaries itself. And I think that, yes, uh, if we did not have this violence, of course, uh, civil society and the government itself will have a lot of discussion. This is perfectly normal. What is not normal is this type of violence in the middle of all these discussions. So it's different point of view about everything. You know, reincorporated people want more communitarian reincorporation, some of them, and the government were more individual. But this is a normal you know, the discussion about public policy, and there is a lot of ways to promote dialogue, but even the dialogue, dialogue is starting to be so tense. So part of our work is to put and create bridges between different parts. So including the government, we are talking a lot with the government, we are talking a lot with you, we are talking a lot basically with everyone. And they, I have to say that also some of the government institutions itself have the same message that me protect the people, help us to protect people. So it, it, it's quite interesting also. Yes, I'm a question. Yeah, I'm still trying to understand a bit why the development has reached this state of, of affairs as that you were describing mm -hmm. as a really awesome. Uh, and I'm going back to the peace, the, the, the peace agreement, the peace accord as such. There was a referendum and there was a majority against it. It was not very big, but still, that was a fact uh, before it was actually uh, adopted or uh, started to be implemented. How, if you're looking at uh, uh, how, what people in general think about the peace agreement, that in parentheses, it was extremely generous, this was extremely ambitious. And one of the problem, I, I, I visited your country 2017 and looked yeah. a bit into this. And one of the main problems was that the government and the public structure didn't have the, 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 the instruments to implement the agreement. It was, yeah. but in general terms, would you say that people now support the agreement as much or 
uh, as they did when there was the referendum, or are there fewer people that are actually supporting the peace agreement as an agreement to vote? I think that the majority of the people are supporting peace itself. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the regions where the peace agreement are being implemented or are trying to implement are more supportive with the peace agreement, not with the agreement itself, with the implementation of the peace agreement. So most of these people are saying that this is happening because we are not implementing the peace efforts. And there is one part of the peace agreement who say that who will fill the power vacuum in these regions? And that was the gap. We never as a society fill that gap. So the presence of the state takes too long to be there in a social way. Uh, in some parts, that presence will never came. That is why, in the other hand, uh, the narrative of the government was so aggressive against the peace agreement. And that produced uh, like a turtle effect in the implementation that this is not the most important thing that they have to do. Uh, and that affected a lot, affected a lot. It's like the, some of the high level politicians say that let's this thing fail. We can handle this failure. And now they are realizing that mm, it was not a good idea. So also some of those politicians supporting this idea to be very aggressive against the peace agreement are changing their opinion. But I believe that it will take a lot of time to recover ourselves or what happened these four years. And about the why, I'm also thinking why the development of the situation like this way. But mainly I think that we let things happen. At the beginning, you know, that key two years, the first two years was key, and we let the things happen. But yeah, and we, we, we started to advertise this, you know, from the 18 or 19 that this will happen. I think that there is another question. Um, I think I, we're actually going to have to take the question from Zoom now. Yeah. Uh, we've already uh, gone a little bit over time, oh, so I sorry. think we're going to take one. Oh no, don't be sorry. So we'll take one question from Zoom, and then uh, that way people who need to run off will be able to do so. Uh, yes, we have from Stephen from Warchild here in Sweden. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> he says, "Hi, Lara. Thank you for an interesting presentation. I met with a few embassies last year in Bogota, who all had the same message that when they try to raise the parts of the peace processes uh, that aren't going so well, state authorities refuse to discuss. What can we do to support civil society and ensure state institutions live up to their responsibilities?" We talked a little bit about this before, but yeah. I think that I have to take a coffee with Stephen. Uh, in, in Sweden to discuss this further, but what can we do? For, I, I think that we need to pressure a little bit more our own governments from here and in Europe to ask more results, please. Mm -hmm. And to, it's, it, it's quite interesting how uh, this government uh, to put a, a lot of European countries to say that no, no, we don't want to talk about human rights violations. It's supposed that we need to talk about human rights violations. It's supposed that we need, as our countries uh, elected to the follow up of the peace agreement, to have something to say. So I need that the message is, Stephen, and all of you is uh, let's push to be here. You know, how to support the civil society, but to tell the people here, the civil society, even if the civil society sometimes will be a little uncomfortable of if they have some messages, because sometimes I understand that it's difficult to be in the shoes of the diplomatic body. You know, you are receiving a lot of calls and you know, this is not working good. This is not working good. This is not working good. And sometimes people say that, tell me that something is working good. But, mm, I understand that, but right now we have the opportunity to focus in one thing. So let's push a little bit more for protection. Let's push a little bit more to recognize civil society. You are doing an excellent job in the country, by the way. 
<laughs> colleagues of Varshal, uh, especially you, <laughs> soon hope preventing first recruitment. Uh, so let's continue to do that. Let's try to increase the effort. Let's try to, you know, visibilize what people are doing in a positive way. I mean, Joe says that, yes, you and then and you. I don't know. Uh, you. No, no, you. you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so thank you very much. My first statement about the upcoming presidential elections uh, in May. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the leading candidate, get vote, and he will win the elections. What are your expectations? What, what can change in Colombia when it comes to the peace process and violence against human rights defenders? And what are your fears? Since the country is so divided politically, if he will win. Would there I, be more violence? I, I have a, a different answer to that, but maybe I want to listen to the next question and then I will answer the difficult one. No, I, I, I just want, I've done some research on Colombia and the peace agreement and so on, and something that I reflected on that I feel has not been discussed so much is all the neoliberal policies that were implemented or uh, agreed upon at the same time as the peace agreement was negotiated, for instance, with the mining strategies. Mm -hmm. And so essentially at the same time as the peace agreement was written and signed, it was also, also made it much more easy to open mines and to exploit for, mm -hmm. for minerals. Um, so I think that is also one of the answers mm -hmm. to why this violence has appeared because many territories where FARC were active are also very rich in minerals mm -hmm. and it's a huge economic opportunity there um, to use those resources and then it is this relationship with protecting or weird linkages to armed groups that actually execute violence on behalf of someone else higher up to make sure that these industries can actually establish and that there aren't any provocative civil society organizations that are in the way. Yes, I don't have nothing else to say. Yeah. Yes. So, so in short, there was there was a comment about post post the uh, peace agreement. There were some neoliberal policies put in place that, in in particular, opened up. Uh, mining opportunities in areas that previously had been controlled by the guerrillas, uh, and that those mining opportunities now are being facilitated, sometimes to the detriment of uh, indigenous populations and, and locals. Yes. Yes. And then uh, the question before that was, uh, what can we expect if the now leading presidential candidate Pietro wins? I honestly, I don't see you know, I don't believe too much in the polarization narrative of the country uh, because I don't see it in the data, basically. Mm. It seems to be in media because everybody is yelling each other, uh, but it's not the same in data. So basically people are voting uh, more or less a little bit more to the center on the right and the left parties and the left coalitions than before, a little bit more, but then the, and this uh, Centro Democratic, the former party of President Uribe lost a lot of uh, senators, but that was because some of the opportunistic or clientelistic traditional parties decide to not follow Uribe and decide to uh, just take another chance in these presidential elections. Um, Something that is really interesting this time as there in the last election in 2018, peace, you know, accomplished in favor, accomplished the peace agreement or against the peace agreement was in the center of the presidential debate. Now, no, it's not in the center of the presidential debate. The debate is starting to be if Petri is good or Petri is bad. Hmm? I don't know. If Patrick's good or bad, I cannot answer that. I can take a coffee after that, you know, a little bit more, but uh, I cannot answer that in my position about, you know, preference about one candidate or another. What I can say is that uh, what civil society is demanding that despite, you know, any of the candidates that win the election, Petro, Cardo, Gutierrez, whatever people, 
uh, they need to accomplish that because it is a constitutional mandate to accomplish peace and because it is written and because the state have the full responsibility to implement. And something that is seen as a positive in this next presidential election. So we have a huge challenge there, but we don't have this in these candidates, all of them. And this is so surprising. We don't have a super strong voice against peace. And maybe that is because there is dividends of peace. Remember that I started this presentation that they are dividends of peace. So peace happened. So far guerrilla are demobilized, as, as demobilized. They are in the Congress. And apparently they, you know, everybody was so scared about FARC in the Colombian Congress. Because what are they going to say? But they are to say basically nothing strange, you know. Uh, more support to victims, okay more things and things and things you know the political behavior of the political party of FARC is just a normal political party hmm? uh, it's not even a super super <laughs> communist nothing but happened with them there uh, so people are starting to think that well, maybe it was not so a good idea you know to be against that uh, and there is a lot of people also in these four years that understand that the gender approach doesn't mean that you will become all your children gay. And that it was also reflected uh, in the Congress election, in the Senate, all this, no? The most, most, most conservative candidates didn't get a lot of votes now. So it's quite interesting what will happen uh, in any case, uh, we need to protect the people, to protect the institutions, and basically trying to protect democracy from the bottom, then the local uh, regions to the top, in the presidential elections in Bogotá and in all the cities. So that is our role, to support civil society to do that job. After the conference, we can talk a little bit more about it. <laughs> and uh, on that note, um... I'm going to have to say thank you so much, Laura, for speaking with us today. It's been uh, so good to, to get your perspective on the role of civil society in Colombia, uh, on the need to protect the population, organizations, uh, and the interconnectedness of this problem, that it's not just the issue that sometimes the media wants to describe it as. Uh, thank you so much for being with us here today. And I'm going to say goodbye to our friends on Zoom. And I'm sure that the conversation will continue in this room. That's great, great. Thank you so much, Karin. And final comment, you can also support the initiatives of reincorporate the population directly in Instagram. There is a lot of lovely things that they are doing for peace. And they say that this is our way to do peace now. So we are doing honey, we are doing coffee. It's a lovely clothes uh, <laughs> manifest, by the way, in Instagram. So, and, and they are quite good people doing these things. So that's what I would support them. Sorry for the marketing to <laughs> these initiatives and the partnerships. But yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>